So today we're going back to one of my most favorite shows of my youth and frankly of today. We're looking at Friends and we're watching Chandler trying to buy a wedding ring. This here is an example of a good cop, bad cop negotiation gone completely off the rails. Let's take a look. Oh, this one's nice. I like this one, sir. Uh, kind sir. Can I see this one? Wait a minute. Now, this, this is the reason you brought me, okay? I know how to haggle. So let me handle this from here on out. Can I help you? Uh, yeah, yes, I would. So Phoebe here is doing what probably most of us would think about in a negotiation like this, which is that this is primarily going to be a haggle over price. Now, to be clear, right, when we're buying something in a one-off situation, and, and hopefully a wedding ring or an engagement ring is a one-off situation, there are ways in which it feels completely one-off. Most of this is going to be about price. On the other hand, there are other aspects to even a single-issue negotiation like this that might suggest that it's more than just price. For example, there may be all sorts of services that this jeweler can offer that might actually create some value in this negotiation. In addition, the purchaser, in this case, potentially Chandler, uh, may also be able to create some value. Like for example, as a young adult, he probably has a lot of friends who are young adults who might be getting married in the next few years and he could be a good source of business referral. Simply to say that most negotiations even ones that look primarily like a one issue haggle actually are a little bit more than that. But Phoebe, it seems, is a artful haggler, so let's see how this tag team negotiation goes. Uh, yeah, yes, I would like to see that ring, please. Or not, whatever. <laughs> this ring is from the 1920s. It's a one and a half carat diamond with sapphires on either side. Sir, could I ask you to, um, could you hold out that ring and ask me to marry you? Okay. okay. <laughs> Will you marry me? Oh my God, that's it. That's the ring. <laughs> uh, poor Chandler. One of the things you absolutely want to avoid in negotiation is complete disclosure. Absolutely showing your hand. Now, I want to make a distinction here between showing your hand entirely and sharing your interests. Because some negotiators will never actually share what their interest are, is. They act as if they're uninterested in something they're interested in, in a way to almost bluff or use it as leverage. And this is not a best practice. Really good negotiators actually do share their interests. But there's a distinction between sharing your interest and sharing the intensity of that interest with 100% and full disclosure. And in this case, right, as soon as we see Chandler get emotional and saying, this is the ring, if you're the seller, your sell price just went way up. This guy has shown too much. And we see this happen all the time. I have to say, this has happened to me many, many years ago when I was first looking for a house to live in. And I, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a place where the real estate market is extremely tight and it's very hard to, to find a unit that frankly stays on the market for more than a few hours. And after seeing more than 80 places, I finally walked into a place and I knew it was gonna be my place and I said, oh my gosh, I love this place. And as soon as I said it, I wish I could reel those words back in because the selling agent was there and heard me. And so, there's this way in which we certainly want to say, I'm interested in the house and this house has many nice features, which is really different from completely showing your hand. How much is it? Chandler, I, I will handle this. How much is it? <laughs> okay, let me just pause there again because we see the same line repeated twice. How much is it? And what we also see that draws a laugh here, but that really matters in, re in real life negotiation is the tone. Now, now, clearly there's something exaggerated here. I mean, Chandler's how much is it is like, please let it be low enough that I can afford it. And her how much is it is, this is barely worth anything. 
neither of these, right, are really the right tone. But I think the negotiation lesson I want to have you be attentive to is the way in which the same exact words will land differently depending on the tone that you're using in the negotiation. 8,600. We will give you $10. Are you interested in this ring? Yes, yes, but I can only pay $8,000. Okay, I can let it go for eight. We stand firm at $10. How would you like to pay? Uh, credit card. Okay, let me just pause here because clearly there's this invitation to haggle that starts from the jeweler and then it's continued with Phoebe. A number of things I want to say about this. The jeweler has a very precise dollar amount and that is a best practice in general. Now, from this clip, we have no idea what that number, 8,400, whatever, is based on, but we know it's not a round or random number and in negotiation, whenever I'm going to throw out an offer, I always want it to be based on some kind of criteria. And we know from research that if it's a precise number, people on the other side tend to assume that it is based on something. And we always, as the offer, want to make sure it is based on something. And this leads to kind of the next important point here. What Phoebe does is just say $10, which is kind of a random anchor to set up the haggle. But a more skillful response would be to say, say more about what that number is based on. In other words, is it in fact based on some criteria? And if there's no response to that, then a really good negotiator would propose a number that is based on some kind of criteria. Because what we see Chandler do here is make a common negotiation mistake. He throws out a number, and as far as we could see, the number is based on exactly one thing, what's in his budget, which has very little resonance on the other side and will almost certainly guarantee that if it is in fact within the range that the seller would want it, that he's going to get a yes. And if it's not in the range, he's going to get a no. And what happens to Chandler then? He either has to walk away or he has to move his number up. And if he moves his number up, what's the problem with that? The problem, he's now shown himself to be a negotiator without any credibility. Because he said, this is the most I could pay. But then he could pay more. And so now, this person on the other side has no credibility. Instead, if you're going to counter, make your counter based upon what is a fair and appropriate number for the thing that you are actually looking to buy. So to review, First, in a negotiation, even one that looks like it's about a single issue, like price point, almost always there's some additional value to be mined here. In this case, the jeweler can offer things like free fittings for a lifetime. Uh, in fact, it turns out, for better or worse, people's ring size changes or annual cleanings. The buyer here can offer referrals or will say that, I'll come back through the years when I want to get jewelry for the holidays or a birthday or a silver or golden anniversary. And in almost every negotiation, even ones that present as pure price points, there are value creating opportunities. And so trying to take a single issue negotiation and make it into multiple issues and create value is actually good for both sides. Secondly, just remembering to always have a reason for your number and to do what you can to avoid getting into a haggle. Haggles where one side anchors really high and the other side anchors really low tend to just reward people who can hold out longer and make smaller concessions in exchange for larger ones. Whenever you're invited into a haggle, instead ask the question, what is the basis for that number? Or what is the basis for that offer? And if it's grounded in well-researched criteria, thank them and then counter with something else that's grounded in well-researched criteria. If they have no well-researched criteria, simply reject the number entirely and propose your number and the reason for it. Um, so one thing I want to observe is the jeweler mentions that this ring has some history to it, right? It's from the 1920s. Now, presumably, if you're a jeweler and you care about this stuff or you're a collector, 
this may have some resonance or meaning. In this case, like Chandler and Phoebe, it's like, they don't care. One of the things a skillful negotiator does before making a sales pitch is actually ask, so what are you looking for? Or what is important to you? Or I see you notice this ring. What do you like about it? Because when I understand why you've been drawn to this or what's important to you, it allows me to actually put something out there that matters to you, that's persuasive to you, instead of just making an assumption that in this case falls completely flat. So do you have examples of non-monetary value ads that you've either offered or been offered to you that helped you seal the deal? If so, please put them in the comments below so we can all learn. And speaking of learning, make sure you subscribe to my channel, make sure you like this video, and ring the bell so that you'll never miss new videos that offer all sorts of fun learning. I'm Bob Bourdon with the Cambridge Negotiation Institute. Thanks so much for watching. Okay, it's not difficult to keep watching. Click, click.